Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Pond5, the world's stock media marketplace. If you're a media maker who needs stock video clips, photos, illustrations, music tracks, or sound effects, check out Pond5 for instant downloads at the best prices anywhere. Check out Pond5 at pond5.com. And for 25% off this month, use code TWIT25. And by audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash frame rate. When does he get it? He doesn't. Why not? Because he broke the rules. No rules. We didn't see any rules, did we, Charlie? Wrong, sir. Wrong. Wrong, sir. Wrong. Wrong, sir. Wrong. Wrong, sir. Wrong. You lose. If I sign by him, you get washed. You get sterilized. You get nothing. Welcome to Frame Rate episode 67. I'm Tom Merritt. Hey, I'm Brian Brushwood. That's Gene Wilder. I'm hey. just going to put that up from now on. Good day, sir. Good day. You lose. You lose. You lose. You know what? When that started, when I started watching that, I was thinking, oh, it's one of these remixes. You know, I've seen a ton of these, but that one's really good. Oh, it's really good. And I wish we had time to play the, the rest of it. You can find it online. Just look for uh, Willy Wonka. You get nothing re- uh, remix by Seriously Serious. SRS, yeah, you'll find it. Yeah. But uh, it's uh, it gets way better later on, too, where he starts mixing up the words and the yeah, meanings. Yeah, we showed you the crappy part. <laughs> should have warned we, me, we Brian. We sift out the chaff and give you just the more wheat. wheat wow, chaff, you just, thought that ooh, was good? The wheat. Really? You liked that? Wow. <laughs> All right, <laughs> let's move on to the big story. This just in, the big story. Uh, you got really excited about this Coney 2012 video. Through It was the first story in the frame rate lineup when we started putting things in for this episode. Well, what? it happened also. Here, here's the thing. And first of all, let me be real clear. This is, this is a political hotbed issue, and everyone's you're either fired up because you think this guy is, is the devil molesting stolen children on the other side of the world. He needs to be stopped. Or you think that the, the organizers who created the video are a bunch of uh, slacktivists and it's not going to do anything. I don't care about any of that. I'm going to say I've never seen anything like this explode virtually overnight. This video, for those who aren't, aren't familiar with it, Coney 2012 comes from a group called Invisible Children. And uh, essentially, they've taken elements from documentaries that they've worked on in the past, and they've created this 30-minute video. Uh, and it's as though they calculated how to make the perfect viral phenomenon. And that from the very beginning, the moment the video starts, uh, it's, it's very clearly highly, highly produced. You have engaging photos and a challenge, a direct challenge to the people at home. Like, we dare you to watch the rest of this. And there's a sense of mystery at the beginning. And then uh, they also, they tell a compelling narrative about one particular child. And then then they go on to essentially begin the mass marketing of a supervillain. I mean, I've never seen anything like this. That uh, You're right. I mean, there are lots of controversies around this, especially from folks who have been working in Africa, working in aid organizations, working in non-governmental organizations. Uh, and even some of them are, are split on exactly what they think. Most of them think that this really 
isn't the way to go about it. This isn't the right priority, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But with, but leaving all that aside, they're all jealous of the attention, and, and admittedly so. I'm not I'm not using that as a pejorative. I mean, they have written. We are very jealous at how much attention this has got. If our causes and our priorities that we've been pushing for decades could get this much attention, we would be over the moon. And, and you're right, Brian. I mean, what these filmmakers have done for whatever reason and, and, and through whatever funding and with whatever motivation, and I mean that, whatever motivation, I'm not going to try to speculate what it is, they have created something which they admittedly in several interviews have said, we were targeting this towards high school age people. We wanted right. we wanted people at the high school level to identify it, uh, to to sit through it, and I think that may be you know the sidebar here, Brian, is that they got folks who generally are thought to have no attention span to watch a thirty minute video. Well, and think about it, man. Like thirty minutes on YouTube, this is like Lawrence of Arabia for viral videos. This thing's the longest, the single longest thing most of these kids have ever even watched on the site. Yeah, exactly. So uh, it as as a web video phenomenon, I think this is going to be a uh, I don't know if it's a bellwether or a a a, a high water mark or I don't know, I don't know what kind of metaphor. <laughs> it's the new standard by I mean it's certainly it's, the current it's, it's going to be uh, yeah, it's going to yeah. be some sort of this. milestone. There you go. Milestone. Like That's that what it is. So uh, here's the other thing that uh, how, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, the, the, the sheer volume, this thing, uh, the reason it was the first thing in the dock is because it dropped like, uh, I think only, or I guess it dropped before frame rate, but it, but it got on my radar right before the success blew up. Uh, in seven days, it's pushing 80 million views. And until the backlash started before any, because for most people, this is the first exposure to invisible children, first exposure to, to the, this whole Coney thing. I'd never seen a perfectly green bar with with over a million likes on on it. That was the other thing too. That uh, that I, I don't know. It's just amazing to see the whole thing explode. Well, but, I, and I'll be honest. When I first saw it, I thought, like as you wrote in our in our lineup, the real life marketing of a supervillain. I was like, wow, if we could take the action and energy uh, and devotion that got behind the SOPA protests and actually go after people who are doing much worse things, that would be cool. The controversy then followed when people said, well, some of the facts in the, in the video aren't great, and they're sim oversimplifying, and they're using the story of a white child and white guilt, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's, that's uh, brilliant. That's, that's smart. That's exactly what they need to do. Keep in mind, it's not only it's the, it's the quality of the production, it's the fact that it's targeted to a highly active uh internet centric demographic and they, they they do other things too they make the answer not give us money they don't make the answer let's physically go over there and feed them and protect them the, the answer is hey man one night next month stay up all night sneak out of your parents place and put up posters all over town and you'll be fighting the crowd this is brilliant if what you want to do is get kids excited about it this is exactly what it's going to do. And I think w one of the, the big controversies comes down to, is this the thing to get kids excited about? No doubt that, that this guy and the Lord's Resistance Army are awful. And, right. uh, and, and they, they absolutely deserve to be punished. And they are on you know the criminal court's most wanted list for a good right. reason. But a lot right. of folks at foreign policy initiatives, a lot of folks who know this stuff say, this, this isn't top priority. And, and it's hard to make that argument to anybody who watches this video because they're like, yeah, how is he not top priority? Look at all the horrible things he's doing. And they're like, well, yeah, uh, everybody's, there's lots of people doing j just as horrible things all over the world, right. you know, and the solution isn't to target one man. And I think about, you know, going after Osama bin Laden, much, much more key to a, a much more widespread and effective organization than the Lord's Resistance Army. Osama bin Laden took, got taken out. Al-Qaeda has not been stopped because right. it's not taking out one man that stops the Lord's Resistance Army from being the kind of thing that happens. It's a much more complex problem. That, that's what people have against this. But you're right, Brian. I mean, as far as an effective way to get a large number of people very excited about an important topic, they nailed it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the only other thing that was a big factor was the timing of this, because keep in mind, like they've been doing this documentary for a while. And in fact, there's there's a problem in that 
so much of his army has degraded and they, they've sort of had to say in the video like well he's not as big as he was but he's still pretty big and he's not in uganda anymore but we had to put all that footage in there because we've got that sweet ugandan footage uh but the reason it's taking off now is because we're coming up uh what on a year after the anniversary of having taken out osama bin laden there's there's a, a vacuum of, of who's the big bad guy that everyone needs to uh be worried about or feel bad about and i think that's the reason it's taking off right now now uh, there is another chapter here there's a lot of backlash uh, from people, again, for, for all whatever their reasons are. But it's interesting to watch them uh, address the the criticisms with their responses, trying to get people to um, uh, to they're, they're trying to say they're transparent. But uh, I, I, I don't know. You, you can see you can you, you'll decide for yourself. Take a look at the response video and let us know what you think at frame ratio at gmail dot com. All right, let's move on to another big story. Stop everything. It's another big story. This one's a lot less political, uh, and it involves Hulu and their original programming. GigaOM actually has a really good article up about how Hulu is becoming a test bed for the network. So unlike Netflix, which sort of says, look, we want to we create original programming and we want to put it out there and use it as, as something that gets people to watch Netflix, and and. And they've sort of indicated, they've made statements in the past that they wouldn't mind then licensing out that programming that they're paying for later. Hulu is more actively saying, oh, yeah, we, we would like to spin out our programs onto network television. Think of us as the, the minor leagues, as the feeder network to broader broadcast television. Uh, and they've signed a deal with Fremantle Media to distribute Morgan Spurlock's documentary series A Day in the Life for a second season as well as having Fremantle uh, do some, some other development for them. But they're going to take those and put them on the air in other networks, in, uh, in other areas like the UK, Australia, New Zealand. I, I think that's fantastic. And it, it, this isn't necessarily new. I guess it's new that, that they're being upfront with that being their intention. But we have, of course, seen a number of projects that started off as web video that made the transition to the big leagues. And in fact, there are cable networks that are, uh, for example, U2 television, that's Y-O-U-T-O-O, -O, a number of their programs uh, started off just as YouTube programs that they've taken the old footage and that they've repurposed it and put it out on on uh, on their, their primetime cable lineup. It's not surprising either with Hulu being jointly owned by... Comcast, which owns NBC Universal, by Fox, by Disney, which owns ABC, that they would be including this in their DNA. Like, well, how can how can we benefit our corporate benefactors? Uh, what right. if we were able to take you know shows and and you know use them, get them get them a, a cult audience on Hulu? And they and they mention uh, something that I know Glenn Rubenstein has been a big fan of, Misfits on Hulu, as a possible example of where the parent companies may eventually take that and, and put it on TV. Yeah, no, I, I hope, uh, I hope, I think we need a big success story to come out of this. We need a Coney 2012 moment for the transition of, uh, of a show that started on Hulu and then became a success in primetime television. Yeah. So anyway, the, the two big stories here, Fremantle Media getting the rights to go shop the Hulu shows elsewhere and then Misfits, uh, you know, being adapted for broadcast TV, but Hulu taking a little bit of a different tactic going the other way, which, you know, you could you could have a knee-jerk reaction and say, that's the wrong direction. We need to be moving TV onto the Internet. But as a matter of fact, I don't think it's the wrong direction. I think it's a great transition business that will help us all make that transition by saying, hey, you know what, we're not just going to shut down all the broadcast networks if we had all the power in the universe. Uh, we, right. we, want, we want it to be a smooth transition where all the good creative shows get made and this may be one way to help bridge it instead of trying to shut down the internet which is kind of what seems and, to and don't the case think of it in terms of uh content going from the awesome guys to the jerk guys think of it in terms of content going to where some of the eyeballs are to where all of the eyeballs are and then i mean for for as much as we are all excited and the listeners of this program are all excited about what's happening in new media the fact is the numbers bear out that the vast vast majority 90 plus percent of everybody is still watching their content real time on the dumb pipes in the living room talk about uh, strange partnerships and transitions that leads us to yet another big story tucking your bootstraps it's yet another big story netflix in talks with comcast or other cable companies 
to discuss adding Netflix as a streaming service to their cable offerings? Brian, could it be true? Uh, dude, it makes sense. I mean, look, when everybody buries the hatchet when they can make a buck on it, you know, and Netflix is a tremendously powerful brand. And if you have your own cable network with your own on demand service and it's fledgling and nobody uses it and you could just do a handshake and all of a sudden be able to say Netflix and make it to where you're not competing, but it's all part of the package. I, I, I mean, I've said this over and over and over again. I'm convinced that the only thing the cable companies care about is keeping those giant fat hundred to two hundred dollar monthly subscription going. And if part of that means throwing some bucks to Netflix in order to be able to throw their logo on everything, yeah, Time Warner Cable, then yes, they'd be stupid to not take that opportunity. Well, apparently they're stupid because Comcast <laughs> spokeswoman Alana Davis told Fierce Cable, quote, we have no plans to offer access to Netflix to our customers through our Xfinity TV service, no matter what device. So, so they're, they're not even going to allow a Netflix app on a possible set-top box out there. And and that makes sense because they have that Streamfinity service or Streamium or whatever it's called that yes. is a Netflix competitor for current Comcast subscribers. And in fact, I got an email from somebody who works at Comcast. I don't know if they, I won't say his name, but uh, but saying that specifically, like, well, that's the reason we're not doing Netflix because we're doing this other thing. And then, he do, and then he said something very cryptic. He's like, plus, we got some really interesting stuff that I can't talk about. So... Whatever, whatever you're cooking up over there apparently has one of your employees excited, Comcast. Good job. Uh, but Reed Hastings would, I think you're right, Reed Hastings would, would be remiss if he wasn't going around to the cable company saying, hey, you know, we, there's an opportunity for us to work together. Should we work together? Cable companies all want to tell him to blow off. That's not his fault. Right. Uh, however, what is his, maybe not his fault, but his problem is that Netflix being a producer is turning out to make Netflix deal with all the problems that Hollywood already knows about. And I'm sure there's lots of Hollywood studio execs out there laughing up their sleeves at this. But Hollywood Reporter said Wednesday that David Fincher, who's directing uh, the 26 episodes of House of Cards, wants MRC, which is Media Rights Capital, the production company, to come up with a $100 million button budget and has threatened to walk if those demands aren't met. So it's yeah, not directly gotta, Netflix that he has the issue with, but Netflix is sitting there going, well, wait a minute, I thought we had this all worked out. Yeah, you got to admit that Netflix has enjoyed the sweet spot for a long time where it's like they're not creating any of the content. They don't have to deal with any of the of the talent or uh, of the producers or any of the uh, the entanglements of previous. I mean, not directly, but now that they are getting hands on, uh, you're right. I got to imagine that there's a lot of old media, big media types that are that are giddy with excitement at this at this frustration. Yeah, and you know what? The Frankly, uh, MRC, the production company, said, no, David Fincher's in Baltimore. He's working on scripts. The actors are there. Everything's fine. Uh, yeah. I have a feeling that this is par for the course in any kind of production where they say, no, I want a bigger budget. Well, no, you can't have a bigger budget. And then they figure it all out. Uh, so this is just interesting because it's Netflix right. at the top yeah. writing the check. And it is, and it is, and it is news because of that. Because I mean, again, this is this is a new venture for them, and it will be interesting to see uh, the first time they have something like this blow up in their face. And I, again, I don't think this is going to blow up; they're going to work it out. But I think uh, we'll be hearing more stories like this. I do also think that you would like a way to save money on your own productions, which brings us to today's sponsor, Pond Five. Oh my gosh! Quick, hold on. I'm going to go to Pond5.com. This is my favorite new game, Pond Five. I'm going to make a movie. It's going to be something about time travel and go. Name it. Buffalo. Buffalo. B-U-F-F-A-L-O. Buffalo. You know what I did? I just typed in buffalo. There Look they are. It. Time got... traveling buffaloes. Time traveling buffalo. See, look at that. I can slow motion it, and then, and then maybe I could add an explosion, and he just shows up in Jurassic Park. Yeah, exactly. This is amazing. Oh, look. He's at the planet of the brown grass. <laughs> he almost took a step. For those of you guys who don't know, Pod 5 is an amazing way to get stock art for, and not just stock art, but also music and, and video and high quality stuff. Like, look, I don't have, I don't have any look kind that. of in, uh, helicopter aircraft. shot over a river. Yeah, but I could lie and I could tell people that this is my backyard. And that's your flying I buffalo. Wouldn't. And I'd have. And, I'd have, and there they are know. at the Buffalo Bills game. Oh, and so I like this movie that you're creating, and it's, it, it, this is the thing. Pond 5 is full of all this kind of stuff that's royalty-free. So you pay for it, and then you can use it in your videos, and you don't have to worry about, like, oh, now every time I use it, i got to pay another 20 You know, want to hear a buffalo? Yeah. Yes. <laughs>
That's that's when the uh, time traveling machinery doesn't work. That's that's, <laughs> that's frustrated right. sound the buffalo makes. You can remix this and make it sound like like evil stuff. Anything you can imagine to illustrate your vision, inspire your creativity, and bring your production to the next level. Pond Five has it, and a lot more, as you can see. Uh, but don't take our word for it. Ask the buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, if you're like, you know what, I got buffalo out in my ranch. I, uh, you can you can sell your buffalo stock footage. You can sell any kind of stock footage on there. You get industry leading royalties on every sale. Uh, if you're a media maker working with video images or sound, go there right now. P O N D the number five dot com. Check it out. As you a special I... offer for our audience members, twenty five percent off your purchase this month when you use the coupon code TWIT twenty five. That's pond five dot com. Use the code TWIT twenty five. There's a lot of buffalo on this site. <laughs> <laughs> I'm clicking. Th- I'm on page 24 of Buffalo. That's amazing. Wow. Pond5.com. We thank them for their support. And their buffalo. And their buffalo. A forecast. Time for the Slipstream. Oh, you have no idea how excited I am about this story. Okay, so yeah, we talked in the past about uh, the plans to have you bring in your... Paramount, Warner Brothers, Sony Pictures, Fox, Universal, DVDs to a physical location so that you can have them converted to digital video because, of course, that makes sense. Sure. Uh, Warner, Walmart uh, is apparently going to announce they are the ultraviolet partner with those studios. And for 2 to $4, all you have to do is drive your minivan over to the local Walmart, truck <laughs> in that box of DVDs, 2 to 4 bucks per title depending on the title, and they'll turn them into high-quality SD or HD digital ultraviolet cloud locker files for you. Okay, now, here, how much here's, easier could let's, it be? Let's, let's be clear about this. When they say turn into, they're not taking it and scanning it and providing an archive of your particular copy of it. Some guy's looking at it, sticking a sticker on it, and then flipping a switch and just enabling you to watch this movie over here. This is so horrendously tedious idiotic. This is going to be an utter disaster. Nobody's going to want the inconvenience of bringing all their crap in. This is, last time we talked about this, I called it doing your taxes. This is worse than doing your taxes. This is having to pay to do somebody else's taxes. And just so you can get your own media back, this this is a bad idea. And it will, <laughs> it will not go well. Well, I, you know, that's the thing, right? Uh, this is an example of saying, look, you know what? I know you bought a car, but if you bring in your buggy whip, we'll actually, uh, you know, turn it into a really high quality keychain for the key, for the keys and the crank to your car. I mean, this is ridiculous. Well, this is an this is an example of copyright law working to roll back innovation, which is where we're at with copyright law. By the way, how to fix copyright uh, is a great book out there that explains in very rational detail, why copyright law is not achieving any of its goals. It's actually getting in the way of innovation. And this is a perfect example of that. What should be happening is that you should be able to easily access all kinds of videos at a fair price and artists get compensated. That's not what this is about at all. This is about inconveniencing you and everyone else and maybe throwing a little money into the studios and the retail chain. But it's not doing anything to encourage new movies. And again, they are pretending that piracy doesn't exist. And no, if you want to stop piracy, stop making your legal solution a parody of itself. Stop going out of your way to make people hate doing the right thing. Because that's all you're going to get out of this. Is people are going to loathe playing by your rules. And especially when somebody goes through all this, shells out three, four, five hundred dollars, bringing out all their DVDs, the the hassle of the whole thing. And then meanwhile, their son, meanwhile, already has all the movies because he's over there <laughs> doing BitTorrent. How how is that going or to be? Or handbrake. Yeah. Yeah. This is just absolutely ridiculous. Uh also ridiculous is the idea that Barry Diller is being sued like crazy, and Barry Diller's got the best response. If you you know if you haven't been keeping up on this story, Aereo is his company. What they want to do is through renting you essentially a mini antenna and some hard drive space, give you access to free over-the-air local broadcasts only while you're in the locale in which they broadcast uh, over the internet for twelve dollars a month. 
So New York City is where they're going to do the trial. New York City is, of course, uh, a place where it's notoriously hard to get over the air broadcast because of problems with skyscrapers, etc. Uh, the geography just isn't good for it. So it's a perfect place to try this out, see if people will pay for it. And they're being sued by everyone, uh, right. as you might expect. Barry Diller at South by Southwest says, look, when you get Radio Shack to pay retrans fees for selling aerials that you plug into a back of a television, I'll start paying too. Right. Well, and, and, and essentially he says, look, yes, you do get to decide where people can watch your affiliate, but you don't get to decide how people can watch your affiliate. And if, they've, if and that's a good point, because essentially their point is, no, 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 not only do we get to decide where people see our content, but we get to decide which way or what tools they use in order to see it. And that and I think he's got a great case for this. And I'll tell you what, man, every quote I'm seeing, it's like he I don't know, I feel like uh I feel like I wish I could have seen the Diller montage as he was working out in the Siberian Arctic, ready for this massive face-off on behalf of uh, new media. Uh, I, I, this is going to be a hell of a trial to watch. Do you think it's even going to go to trial, or do you think they're going to work it out on the side? I think it's going to go to trial because this breaks down a huge barrier to Internet television, and the broadcast networks do not want this to happen. And their only way to settle out of court is to get him to stop, and he obviously is not going to stop. So I mean, there's, there's no, nothing in it for him to stop. So we were talking about this really briefly on This Week in Tech, and the question was, well, it, what, do, what do they get out of a win? Because that doesn't mean that the, commercial, the service is going to be commercially viable. Like, that's not even the question here. The question is whether or not it's legal. So let's say that we now have a legal precedent, and it's clear that this is a legal way to do it, and that the, uh, the local affiliates don't get to decide how people watch the content, or whatever it means. Like, practically, what would be the next step in this, or what could we see change as a result of it? Well, what we could what we could see change is the, a lot of other competitors in other markets coming up with a similar idea uh, and also riffing off of it, saying, OK, well, if Cablevision is legally allowed, as they are, to provide DVR service remotely, and now Aereo has showed they can do over the air remotely, what if I do this remotely? You know what I mean? Like, there's, right. there's all kinds of th ideas that I haven't had or I'd be out there funding startups that I feel think, like could riff off this if it's made legal uh, because it, it's an advancement towards allowing content on the Internet rather than preventing content on the Internet. Do you think that we could see some kind of uh, Zadiva redux where because I mean, I'm, I'm convinced that Zadiva should have been shut down to begin with. But with this precedent, could you see it, certainly not that service, uh, but something like it come back for a second chance? Or does the precedent of Zadiva being shut down like that's already just a black market? There's no chance that'll ever work again. I don't think Zadiva can work because what the court said was, well, you're taking one DVD and using it for multiple people, and that's what we don't like. If they win it with Aereo, what the court's going to like is it's one antenna, one hard drive, one person. Nobody else gets to use it, so there's no broadcast there. At least that's the theory. We'll have to see what the court actually rules, but that's the idea. If Aereo wins, that's right. the logic, which then can say, okay, well, what if I provide uh, a bunch of legally purchased movies from various sources – and put them on a hard drive that only this person can access, and it's one copy and they can only access it, uh, but, it's, but it's getting rid of formatting compatibilities, right? Because right. I'm able to take it from iTunes or Vudu or wherever, you know, like there's all kinds of ways that uh, – viable businesses that this opens up. Uh, if if we're going to explore them all right now with brainstorming with Brian and Tom, our new show. <laughs> right. Uh, another example of – locks and rules meant to prevent somebody forcing them to be more innovative uh, is this new venture from Carlos Slim, usually the richest man in the world, depending on what month it is, uh, right. funding an online network called Aura.tv, O-R-A.tv. And one of the reasons he's doing this is because he is prevented from running a television network in Mexico because he runs a very successful mobile telephone operation in Mexico. And the regulator is like, that's eh, too much power concentrated in one hand. So what he's doing, very reasonably, is saying, fine, I'll use the Internet to broadcast. I'm Carlos Slim. I can afford it. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to bring Larry King back from the dead. Not literally. That's Larry King's been alive. Right there. But Larry, Larry King, King is going to come out of retirement for me and host a show that is probably going to be very similar to Larry King Live used to be on my network. <laughs> <laughs> Zoom in closer. Closer. No, don't get, don't get any. Yes. That's, closer. Wait, I see Larry Albania. is looking at you, Brian. <laughs>
<laughs> this is a coup. This is great. Getting Larry well, King. Is, I mean, you got a big brand name. You got somebody that a lot of people thought was retired for good coming back and doing a show. Now, it also shows up some things about Larry King's relationship with CNN saying when the train gets to the last station, you know, to get off is all right. he'll say well, about and, that. But uh, he obviously the, isn't ready to get off the rail system. Just that train. <laughs> He's, he's not. Hold on. Let's let's work with this analogy. He's not ready to stop moving forward. He just thinks trains are dumb, and he hates Wolf Blitzer. I don't know. the The, the real story to me is that you have somebody who's a major, major celebrity who could be on television tomorrow. He can make a phone call and do anything on any network. Would be happy to have him. And he just has is publicly saying that he has no interest in television. He wants to do this internet video instead. This is this is great. This is part of the rising tide for everybody in new media. Yeah, in fact, there's a there's a bunch more of these kinds of stories this week. Slipstream is full of stuff. Amazon uh, may be getting into original programming. A new Amazon hire named Joe Lewis, not the boxer, uh, has a background in television content production. Uh, it is went on LinkedIn and put his title as vice president of original television at Amazon and then changed it to something more vague about content production. <laughs> what think we think he's in charge of is a section of Amazon I'd forgotten about. Uh, somebody on Tech News Today wrote in and, and reminded me of it where Amazon does give independent producers money to produce original films. And so there's an original films area of Amazon that has existed for a while. But it's, it's not big name directors. They're giving it to to sort of unknowns, people starting out, you know, who show some talent. Is this uh, is this the same as Amazon Studios? Because we talked it is. about it is uh, Amazon okay, Studios. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it mentioned them in a previous episode of Frame Rate. Um, yeah, that's cool. And, and so it may be that he's just that, but there's there's other reports saying no, it's it's going to be more than Amazon Studios. That they, you know, the fact that he wrote original TV content means that. He's expanding on Amazon Studios, and we're going to see original television programs from Amazon. That's a rumor. We'll have to wait and see. But right. uh, there, there are other online video options coming your way this summer. Uh, NBC is going to be providing online streaming through YouTube uh, of the London 2012 Summer Games. So if you didn't like uh, the Silverlight production that NBC was doing at past Olympics, well, now you'll you'll be able to use YouTube's massive network and audience infrastructure. So there'll be a uh, there'll be a combo between those two. I don't think YouTube gets a lot of branding out of this. I think they're contracted really just as a service provider uh, to provide the streaming technology, and the rest of it's going to be on NBC. But yeah. it, it remains to be seen how how much NBC locks it down. Because in the past, what they've done is say, yeah, we'll stream everything to you as long as you prove you're a subscriber to a television package of some sort, like cable or satellite. This is another indication that uh, YouTube is very, very serious about moving into the streaming category. I mean, there's a number of things that we're starting to see, and they're starting to secure more uh, in, in bigger contracts like this, uh, which I, from a branding perspective, I, I don't know how I feel about YouTube's ability to make that transition. YouTube means something to everyone. It's a place you go to watch video on demand, whether it's whether it's someone getting kicked in the nuts or a dog on a skateboard or or a Coney 2012 political type thing. I, I I don't know from a branding perspective how strong they can win over people. Now, I think from an infrastructure perspective, this is going to be very robust. It's going to be very good. They're going to have very high profile contracts. But I feel like they, they should spin it off and give it a different name for a different service. Well, and, and maybe they do. I don't know. I mean, we're seeing it reported as YouTube because that makes it clear who's behind it. Uh, but yeah. but yeah, it's a it's a it's a whole different question there. I mean, I think. NBC contracting with YouTube, which really knows how to do this now, is probably a really good idea. So I'm not going to criticize oh, absolutely. that. Absolutely. Uh, they aren't going to be impressing anyone in China, though, because as we know, Google is blocked for the most part in China. However, they do have their own homegrown services. Youku and Todo have announced plans to merge, creating a new entity dubbed Youku Todo. Youku Todo. <laughs> I think they should have gone with YouTube. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, I mean, it's like they're already they're already given the finger to to you know it's clearly a knockoff of the YouTube concept and and the execution's very similar and then the name might as well just make it just the same. Also, uh, in the ongoing coverage of Google setting up its own cable television service in Kansas City, along with the fiber service that it's rolling out there, uh, the state of Missouri has given the go-ahead. The Missouri Public Service Commission has granted Google Fiber Missouri LLC the authority to build a video service network along public rights-of-way, uh, according to a March 1st order. So, so is it, what, what, what one exactly, more tiny step. 
Do, do we have any clear vision of what the end game of this Kansas City project would be? Well, you mean of the entire project? Yeah. Or Google I mean, like, has, Google has said that, what they want to do is show the benefits of fiber. They want to build out a, a, a fiber network and show to the world, like, this is what you can do. This is good for Google because it means that people use the Internet more, which means Google makes more money. And essentially right. what we want to do is show, like, it's viable. We want to show how, how, how we learn to roll this out so that other companies can do it, so the municipalities can do it. They just want to encourage the rollout of high-speed Internet. And right. the video part of it, I think, is one way that they're going to say, like, look, you know, we rolled out all this fiber, and then we built this video service on top of it, and it was cheap. And, and we're, we're learning about how this business works, which benefits us in providing our services because now we know some of the challenges that our partners face, and it benefits the world because we can share that with them. That's what they say anyway. But, but, did, but does that mean that they become a cable competitor or in they Kansas create? City they do? Google has indicated that it doesn't want to do this in all the cities, that this is at the first of many, that this is a test bed. This is a, an experiment. We'll see if that's true. All right. On to tube tops. Of course, big news. Uh, day after frame rate last week on Wednesday, Apple announced the new iPad, but they also announced a new set top box a new version of the Apple TV. Uh, it's going to do 1080p videos. That means that you'll be able to get 1080p videos of television shows and movies in the iTunes store. And it allows iCloud syncing. So not just television shows, but some movies, although not all studios are on board yet, uh, will be able to be re-downloaded, which is essential for the Apple TV because it doesn't have a lot of onboard storage. So if you buy movies and you want to own them, you'd like to have a locker to keep them in. So is it, does it bother you at all? And I love the title of this article on PCMag.com, uh, the new Apple TV and Apple's home entertainment ambivalence. Like I, I was such a fan of the original Apple TV and I just have grown, gotten increasingly frustrated with their weird meh attitude toward that whole line. Does that annoy you at all, or is it just me? My, it doesn't, it just, doesn't annoy me. I don't take it personally. It's just that they're just a product maker. If they want to make a crappy product, that's no skin off my nose. And I don't think this is a crappy product. So just because they haven't made the magical resolutionary device <laughs> for my set-top box, uh, that doesn't mean that I'm mad at them. Uh, I, yeah. I do think that... I liked the original Apple TV better than the current Apple TV, but I see where they're going with it. Uh, and and I, I wouldn't call it anger, but I, I do have some some sort of dramatic tension about like, okay, what's the end game? Where are they going with this? Because obviously this version of the Apple TV is just another incremental step. It's not, it's got a new interface, it's got 1080p, but this isn't the thing that is what Apple TV is going to be. Although there's rumors out today that Apple TV's television is in production already and will be uh, announced or released in the summer. See, Those rumors that, are going around all the time, though, so who knows? That, that could be the way I could forgive them for all this, is, is if it turns out that the entire Apple TV uh, set-top box is just a way to work out the interface, and the, the, the OS, and the distribution and secure licensing agreements. But, uh, but uh, this is my favorite uh, quote from that article on PC Mag. It says, uh, Netflix is great, YouTube is great, but the main incentive is iTunes and AirPlay. Everything else is either a begrudging necessity or an afterthought. That's, that's what annoys me. It's like, I understand that they want most of all to be able to have a distribution platform and have it be one more way for you to buy crap from our store. But it's like, it's so different from what you see from Google TV. Google TV, they're clearly excited about all the different possibilities that it could go and, and being an open platform and having apps go on. It's, I don't know. There's, there's a number of things. There's just so much they could be doing with the Apple TV that they just couldn't be bothered to even, even think about. Well, I think what they want to do with Apple TV is say, you sit down, you type in the name of the thing you want to watch and you watch it. And they can't do that yet uh, because they don't have all the content. They don't have all the licensing deals. In fact, the iCloud service for movie syncing, it doesn't include Fox or Universal because HBO is in the way. HBO has a license exclusive to streamed versions of certain movies. And this technically is a streamed version because it's stored in the cloud. And so right. according to The Wall Street Journal, HBO is actually loosening its grip on those movies and, and these studios will sign on with iCloud eventually, but it's this old fashioned licensing system still getting in the way. The positive side though is iTunes digital copies of movies can be served by iCloud. So if you buy a DVD and it comes with that iTunes copy 
and you've got that copy you, on the hard drive, you can have it recognized by iCloud, and then that will be available for you to stream. So at least, you know, so there are some benefits to this new service as well. Yeah, absolutely. Intel uh, now, reportedly planning to launch a web-based TV service by the end of this year. Intel? I, I, I thought the same thing. I thought, what a weird space for Intel to, and and not even, I'm not even going to say it's weird that they want to get into it. Obviously, they make the hardware and they have a vested interest in creating another thing that needs Intel chips in it. What I don't understand is the necessity for it to be Intel branded. Why? I mean, unless it's going to do like high-end display or, or gaming on there or something, I just I just can't see the association at all between Intel and, uh, and the content that I watch on This is the Wall Street Journal reporting that, Intel wants to make an Intel-branded web-based television service with an Intel-built set-top box. Now, you'd have to provide your own internet connection, of course. It's just a set-top box with their service built in. But that is the weird thing to me, is that it's Intel-branded. Intel has had bad success with Intel-branded hardware. They, they tried in the early part of the 2000s with some, some sound devices and some cameras uh, and it just didn't go anywhere for them. So they went back to saying, like, okay, we're going to be the in secret ingredient that makes things great. And we're going to define things like the Ultrabook standard, but we're not going to make an Intel Ultrabook. We're going to be right. this, you know, uh, Intel inside is what makes something worth having. And this would be a strange departure for them well, for that. And beyond that, the part that really weirds me out is, like, it's not just a, a set-top box would be weird enough, but a whole service to compete with, with Netflix or Hulu or... I mean, well, I think it's probably less competing with Netflix and Hulu and more competing with Apple, iTunes, uh, Vudu, uh, Amazon, Video on Demand. Okay. I, I feel like it's probably like that, but I could be wrong. Crazy. Uh, Roku needs to raise $50 million to go global, according to paid content. It's aiming to raise that money by this summer so they can come to the UK, France, Germany, and the Far East. Uh, more than the $32.5 million has raised to date since 2008 is necessary. So if you would like a Roku overseas, um, I don't know, call up some venture capitalists, you know, and <laughs> tell them to sink some money. Check those couch cushions. Look for a couple. Maybe you got a couple million sitting around in there. Uh, this is, do, you th do you think this is an indication that that Roku's over the hump and that they've they've penetrated the market well enough that they could just replicate their same success in other markets now? Or, or do you think they're still they still have a ways to go until they because I I'll tell you, man, it's, it amazed me when my parents in law got a, a Roku box. I thought like, all right, well, that means Roku's made it in that it's an object that my non techie relatives will buy now. Yeah, I don't know if it's over the hump. I, I don't see it as widespread. I don't see everyone talking about Roku all the time. I think it is more widespread than it was, you know, and, and that's a good anecdote for that sort of thing. I think this is separate from that. I, I think they're not certainly far from done in the United States, but they're looking at the rest of the world saying, hey, you know what? We have an opportunity there. We think we can get the money if we make a push. Let's go out and make a push to get some investors. And I guess also that, that when you go for international markets like that, it gives you an opportunity to find pockets of, of heavier success than others in markets that are underserved. So, so I guess it is a good gamble for them. TiVo and Comcast have been working together. We talked about the fact that Comcast is not going to bring a Netflix app to a set-top box. So the Netflix app will be a, a, a missing from it. But the TiVo premiere uh, will be working on the cable's Infinity On Demand service. So Woo! maybe that's a side way that you can have Netflix and Comcast at the same time. Uh, but they, you know, that's not funny dot com got its hands on some images of a TiVo premiere box with Xfinity on demand in the menu selection. So it looks like it might happen in the next few weeks. Right on. Let's take a break and thank our other sponsor, Audible dot com, the leading provider of audiobooks with over one hundred thousand downloadable titles across all types of literature, including fiction, nonfiction and periodicals for listeners of frame rate. Audible is offering a free audiobook to give you a chance to try out their service. So go there. You know what? I know that you're not a big fan. So I'm going to give uh, uh, of the book I'm going to recommend, Brian. So I'm going to give you the chance to recommend one too. But I got to point out that the Hunger Games coming out in two weeks. If you're at all interested, you can get a free audio book of the Hunger Games and read the book before you go see the movie. I, I liked the Hunger Games well enough to read the whole trilogy. It was just uh, the, the parts where it suddenly was clearly written for a 14-year-old girl were the ones that annoyed me. I'm actually way looking forward to the movie. I think the movie will be way better than the book. So check it out. You can get that for free. Here's how you do it. Audiblepodcast.com slash frame rate. That's audiblepodcast.com slash frame rate to get a free audiobook. Try out the service. Audiobooks are great, man. I, I read them all the time because 
I actually can read more books when I have audio books. I, you know, clean the house. I, I'm driving somewhere. I'm reading books all the time. It's you know what? We should point out too, like, like, let's say you don't want to spend one red cent. It's, it, it's a free book and then you can just cancel and just go use the code audiblepodcast.com slash frame rate. It helps us out. Yeah. And you get free stuff. Thanks audible for their support of frame rate. Uh, time now for some film foul. Not much in the film film uh, tank this week. Uh, there's an article that got sent in to us by a few different people that Netflix may be thinking about picking up Terra Nova after Fox dropped it. If you're a fan of Terra Nova, you'll be happy about that. Both of you. You know, it's it, what's funny is the backlash to this story. I found a number of articles of people saying, here are 10 things that should come back before Terra Nova. You know, it's and, and then and then it goes on to be just this giant gripe fest about how uh, Fox is the king of creating awesome science fiction properties and then ruin, ruining them all. And then I think every single person on the Internet may have told me about this next story uh, at, over at SlashFilm.com. Topher Grace apparently edited the three Star Wars prequels into one 85 minute movie and the author peter serretta over at slash film went and watched it it was a one-time event uh because of copyright law and fair use etc cetera, etc cetera. no one else will ever get to see this uh i disagree there, there's got to be a way that they can work this out and they can spin it because he got his hands on some of the assets from lucasfilm i believe if i if i read this correctly well and i think part of the reason he was able to get some of those assets is he agreed he would show it in private once and that was the end of it um, uh, I, I can't imagine that, that Lucas would ever approve of this going out. Uh, well, they've been pretty good about fan-made stuff. Yeah, but and this isn't they, fan-made. This, this is basically saying, yeah, all the decisions George made are wrong. But if you no. pile it together into one movie that's 85 minutes long, it's actually not that bad. Uh, they, I'll tell you what, they could, if they spun it as a special remix edit, you know, if they sort of sold the idea that, hey, man, we live in a remix culture, we remix music that we love all the time, and we think it's great that Topher Grace is remixing George fa George's fantastic prequels. I could totally see that. If You are it, living in a dream world, my friend. This will uh, never again see the light of day. There were probably armed guards in the audience making sure no one, <laughs> re like, removed the film or pulled out a camera or anything. That Frameratesshow at gmail.com. Chime yeah. in. You tell us. What, no, not. I want to see some evidence. That's what I want to uh, see because this is never this is never getting out. Well, essentially what he does is he cu cuts out almost all of the Phantom Menace. The opening crawl says that assassins have been sent trying to kill the queen and Jedi have been dispatched to to stop them. And then, boom, you open with a climactic final battle with Darth Maul. And it's like it, all of a sudden Darth Maul, like, you know, doesn't matter who he is or where he came from. He's just an assassin who failed and got cut in half. Spoiler alert. Yeah. Uh, I, I, God, I, I love – think about this. This is the reason that, that I, I love this story is has there ever been – a set of bad movies that more people have gone back wanting so bad to figure out some way to make them good after the fact. Is there, is there anything else like this? It, it's kind of amazing how people are saying, no, but this is something I love so much. And I think it's a testament to the fact that these movies aren't that bad. These movies are just not living up to the high expectations of its fan base, that people are able to go back and come up with new edits and new, new ways of taking the story that work. They're like, well, you know what really bothered me was that pod race in Jar Jar. Take that out, and everything gets a lot better. You know what? What really bothered me is that Darth Maul just disappeared too early. Keep him in. That works a lot better. This should be the story of Obi-Wan. Do that. It works. But in other words, the elements are there. They just didn't like the execution. I think, I think it is really interesting because I, I can't think of anything else. Obviously, we live in an Internet age where, where a lot of this is more easily done than it would have been in the past. But sure. uh, yeah, I can't think of any examples like that either. Are you going to go see this 21 Jump Street? Do you All have right. Like a, a premiering this week. We're going to be having the, uh, this week. the draft. This is what's premiering this week. 21 yeah. Jump Street is premiering this week. Uh, the funny reboot of an 80s or 90s uh, TV show. No, I'm not going to see it. I'm not either. Nobody else is. Sorry, Jonah Hill. But I did uh, see something else, which I'll tell you about in what we're watching. John Carter, should have been John Carter of Mars, was good. Was oh, good. dude, I, 
I wanted I wanted it to be good, and I can't wait to go see it. Uh, I'm, I don't know how it's doing financially. We haven't checked in on that. Uh, oh, that's another thing. A flop financially, yeah. Lorax killed it in its second week. Oh, I'm sure. Oh, it was up against the Lorax. Yeah. Well, no, Lorax was in its second week, but still, it, it oh, didn't matter. That's bad. John Carter was was dead on arrival, I think, in a, in a lot of people's minds. But it's worth going to see. Maybe it'll maybe it'll come back in the in the slow burn, you know, as the the more positive news comes out. But it is only fifty percent on Rotten Tomatoes, so a lot of people are going to look at that and go, "Yeah, it's wow. definitely not worth seeing." Or at least it was on so Saturday the- when we went to see it. The people that hated it, why? what reason do they have to hate it? What were the downsides? Ah, formulaic, over-the-top, blockbuster, blah de blah blah And that's all true. It is formulaic and blockbuster and over-the-top. But, it, you know, inside that arena, it's definitely one of the best of that kind. This is much better than a Transformers. Uh, this is an epic story. Uh, y- yeah, you got to deal with the fact that, uh, you know, what's his name? The guy who plays John Carter, all I can think of him is Riggins from Friday Night Lights. He sounds the same as... He does in any other part that I've seen him in. And he's going to be in Battleship, and he looks totally different and sounds different there. So I don't know if that was maybe a choice on the part of John Carter. But this is a classic sci-fi tale that inspired so many sci-fi properties that came after it, including Star Wars. You see huge elements of Star Wars in the story here. That's- Not that they're ripping it off, but they're like, this was Edgar Rice Burroughs' story in 1912 that well, Lucas the- was inspired by. What I'm afraid will happen is what happened to me the first time I saw The Godfather. By the time I saw The Godfather, uh, everything that made The Godfather great, I had seen parodied or borrowed or or referenced to where uh, by the time I watched The Godfather, it looked horribly predictable, formulaic and over the top cheesy. And uh, I wonder if that's the same problem with with John Carter of Mars in that, um, you know, oh, this is a knockoff from Star Wars. I was like, no. Star Wars is a knockoff of this. Yeah, everything is a knockoff of this, except for H.G. Yeah. Wells. I mean, this is... And and the, the effects are good. The acting is fine. Uh, they, they made some choices that probably annoy some people. For instance, the moons of Mars are shown as round. The moons of Mars yeah. are not round. But that's the way Edgar Rice Burroughs wrote it. So it's kind also, of this weird uh, tension between the fact that they stayed fairly true to Edgar Rice Burroughs. They changed a bunch of stuff that annoyed the true Burroughs fans. They, but they stayed true in some parts, uh, and yet they didn't market it as Edgar Rice Burroughs, John Carter of Mars, John, you know, Princess of Mars, any of the any of the things that really would have tied it to that fan base. Yeah, I, I don't know how strong the Edgar Rice Burroughs fan base is uh, as far as getting out to some the Some of them Vox- are on ventilators, but, you know, they're, they're doing all right. <laughs> yeah, I wish they had just picked a side and stuck with it. I, I feel like they're... The, it's the sin of the mushy middle, you know, like, oh, it's Mars. But don't worry, it's not really about Mars. It's about feelings. And look, there's there's a relationship. Oh, yeah. A- no, that relationship is is very toned down. The, the relationship is not a huge no, part of the Not in the movie. marketing is what I'm saying. Well, that's I, the problem, is, right? It's bad marketing. It's not an artistic yeah. disaster. This is a marketing disaster. And you can see it if, from the wishy-washy way they kept swinging from one side to the other. The arena scene from Attack of the Clones, the pod race from Phantom Menace, are both done right in John Carter. Eileen and I both talked about this afterwards. We're like, didn't that kind of remind you of that? But it was a much better scene. Like, it's a great movie. You should see it. Awesome. All right. I'll definitely check it out. Uh, should we save our Walking Dead talk? Until yeah, after feedback? that in the spoiler zone. Yeah. But, right. but just just uh, just to give kind of a thumbs up, thumbs down, a, a quick thumbnail, uh, happy or unhappy? What? Oh, you're, you're three quarters happy? Yeah. Your, your thumb is, is semi up? Yeah, you know, I, I wore a lot of the three-quarter arm sleeves in the 80s, too. <laughs> it's that thing with me. All right, well, we'll talk about it in the spoiler zone. I, I was, I was very thumb? happy with the episode. Um, still medium happy with the franchise. All right, let's, uh, let's check some feedback. Now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Flame Radio, yeah. T. Perrin Mitchell writes in, says, I was listening to Show 66 where you're talking about skipping the pre-roll ad. I agree. We you, we, you, that idea of typing in the message is flawed. But I do Which- understand why the advertisers want to put this into place and why they have an issue with the skip button. The advertisers want to know that when they pay the money for that ad, their message has gotten across and that viewers remember the brand. As you were discussing this, I thought of a solution that might meet both consumers and advertisers' needs. 
a hybrid system. When an ad comes up, there's a set of radio buttons to the side of the video. The radio buttons are for three or four of the brands that advertise with the video provider. If you click on the button for the brand that is being advertised, then the ad skips. If you pick the wrong ad, the ad plays all the way through. This way, the advertisers get you to think about their brand, and the viewer does not have to sit through the same ad for the 500th time. I don't know if advertisers are going to go for that. I, lo I love it as a consumer. Yeah, sure. I mean, look, this uh, again, I think from the consumer perspective, we already have the best. The The skip ad is is the solution. The ability to you know, sit through five seconds, you're like, yes, yes, yes. I understand you want to sell. I understand that you're at and let's, let's skip this dance and let me get to my video. Uh, this one here comes from Crash Down. Says, "Hi guys, currently watching your. Or I enjoy watching your podcast each week. Keep up the good work. You often mentioned cord cutting and using streaming media. This is something that interests me, but that I don't understand how it works from a practical aspect, such as what equipment I would need to get both streaming and local broadcasts. How to set it up to record both for a playback on a DVR-like device, a video showing how to set up a home theater for cord cutting, or a link to a video showing this would be appreciated. And that's something I thought was a really neat idea. Should we do like a how-to segment or an actual an actual build on the show? You know, uh, that, there's a lot of folks have done this out there. Uh, if you if you do a search for how to cut the cord, uh, there's there's tons of videos showing this. But yeah, I mean, it wouldn't be a bad idea for us to do just sort of a little basics of you know what what are your options uh, when cutting. Maybe the we cord. could do a um, uh, frame rate special, like just a one bonus episode where the two of us talk about and walk through actually different builds you could do at home. Yeah, I've I've done that video a bunch of times, uh, and so <laughs> it would be easy to do again. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Man, I guess that's it. Send us feedback to uh, frameratereshow at gmail.com and we'll read it on the air. We do read all of them and we respond to most of them. And uh, we love that you guys are so interactive. Yeah, thank yeah. you uh, for sending us the emails. Uh, we've got a little spoiler section coming up at the end of the credits. So if you don't want to be spoiled about Walking Dead, unplug your headphones, press the pause button, whatever you need to do, go away. Hey, can I, can we'll I put in you. a... Can I put in a real real quick plug uh, for the, the Scam School book drops this week. And if you're listening to this recorded, it, it published on uh, Wednesday, 314. Uh, it's, if, if you're not familiar, I host a show called Scam School. That's all about how to score free drinks at the bar by using magic and trickery. And we wrote, or I, me and John Tilton wrote, but I believe is the most advanced easy magic instruction guide ever written to date. It's got 80 tricks in there, audio commentaries, over 40 video illustrations on your iPad. It's in the iBook store and on Amazon. Uh, it's only, and we're launching it at half price. It's only $4.99. I think Amazon is even undercutting that side, that price right now, but it's going to be only $9.99 and I'm super, super proud of it. You guys should check it out. Absolutely. Go check it out. Thanks, Brian. And thank you for watching. We'll see you either in the spoiler zone or next week. Well, Brian Brushwood, this week's Walking Dead, I thought was going to be the finale. I mean, the things that happened on it, I thought were going to happen in the finale. Yeah, what's funny is just now I thought, wait, was was that the last episode? There's going to be more? Uh, number one, okay, for those who are uh, full-on spoiler, Shane gets shanked. And, and it, it very... happens exactly the way they showed it on io9. Oh, did they really? I didn't know that I I haven't talked too much in detail about it because they didn't want to spoil people in case they were right. But io9 had an article uh, at the beginning of the, the middle of the season that, that nailed it. They basically wow. said word for word, off into the forest, Rick does it, Carl kills the zombie. Yeah, and, 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 we're, so done, that's and we're done with it. My wife was, was cheering when that uh, happened. I'll tell you what, there are two things that I thought were good. I thought the tension between the two, regardless of how we got here, I'm very, very frustrated with this season, but it was electric in that moment when, you know, Rick knew what was up and saw it coming and the tension was palpable and it was great when all of a sudden, you know, just that quick stab uh, to, to take him out. I also, I, I, I liked question mark. The fact that they kind of gave a nod to what happens in the comic book by letting uh, uh, two things. Number one, they finally explained or, or, you know, did the whole, like, you don't have to be killed by a zombie to come back as a zombie. Just anyone who dies comes back as a zombie. And, uh, and I like the fact that they gave a nod to the fact that Carl shot the zombie version 
of of Shane. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, totally. No, I I I, I kind of wish it had played out the way it did in the comic book, but you know those days are long past. So this this yeah. is an acceptable version for me. I like the idea that they're kind of promoting Daryl into this role of second to Rick, kind of setting that up for next season. And I guess we're about to see how they get to wherever they're going next, whether it's the prison or the governor's city or or, or whatever else. Who knows? They yeah. may go somewhere totally different at the beginning of next season. All right, I got you a can tell with that cord coming at the end of the episode that next week we're they're going to be gone from the house. I have yeah. a feeling. It- the, 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 a couple things. Number one, I, I think it's great that they had the herd and they're going to get chased out of the farm. I wish that there had been more of a buildup for that beforehand. Instead, it's just reading now like, oh, by the way, just a giant wave of zombies. Let's see. If, guess what's going to happen next week? Uh, predictions for next season. Here's what's going to happen. They're, they're going to get chased off the, the farm. And I don't think I don't think that they're going to go to the prison. I think. Uh, no, I, mean, I don't know. They're going to encounter the other group. The governor is going to be leading them and the return of Michael Rooker. That's the group that Michael Rooker found himself with without a hand. That makes sense, actually, because yeah. they're, they're, they're bad guys. So that makes, yeah. that makes perfect sense. All right. Thanks, everybody, for watching or listening. Find us on the web, twit.tv slash FR. Email us, frameratejoe at gmail.com. We'll see you next time.